So when you're diagnosed as an adult, it's like you're getting your life operating manual 30 years too late. Oh, you know, everybody else had it so much easier. You have to have this moment, right? Like you have to have, I'm going to call it a pity party. It's a very well justified pity party where you have that moment of everything could have been so much different and I could have been so much better. And that would have made some things in my life easier, not all, because growing up in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, I, I don't know that anybody knew enough about ADHD to really support it well, but at least I would have known, right? Okay, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Generation Exceptional Podcast with me, Bev Thurgood. I'm joined today by Karen McGill. Karen is an ADHD coach and a creator, and I've been following her for the last year or so. Um, and I'll tell you why, Karen, I was following you so intently is because I got my ADHD diagnosis about 18 months ago, and okay. I was watching a lot of TikToks and a lot of um, sort of Instagram and then I found you on YouTube and it was so lovely to see somebody who was also late diagnosed talking about their story in such a way that I really sort of it, it connected with me and I think looking at your YouTube channel I can see you've connected with a lot of people out there in the same boat as me but I'm not going to give too much away before we get going what I'd really love you to do if it's okay is just tell us a little bit about Karen who are you how did your life get you where you are now as a, uh, a an ADHD coach, late diagnosed ADHD and a creator? Sure. Well, that's a, I was born in a small town. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, sort of the, the Reader's Digest version, um, there was a lot of things that I struggled with growing up, uh, just getting things done, keeping things or organized and it, like productivity wise, but also um, like in relationships and and the way I felt about myself. And I always just thought I was different or somehow flawed or, you know, not dramatically, but I could tell I was different. And um, it wasn't until the pandemic that um, all the compensatory methods I had built throughout my entire life being undiagnosed ADHD started to fall by the wayside. And a lot of that was just extreme um, pressure and not knowing what was going on in uh, that period of time. So I felt a very uh, emotionally dysregulated. Um, but also at that same time, uh, I was starting to go through perimenopause and hormonally things were starting to shift. And for those reasons, I was not really functioning as I usually did. And um, I was listening to another podcast by somebody else who was explaining how they had just been diagnosed as an adult with ADHD and the discussion that they shared and the, and the, the, the ex felt experience that they shared really connected for me. Like it, for me, the idea of sharing those, those experiences is what helps us not just understand what another person is going through, but perhaps identify it in ourselves. So when she shared that story, I was like, oh, light bulb, a light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, this, this has got to be it. This is going to be the issue with me. I was fortunate enough to have access to the proper diagnostic uh, support in order to get a diagnosis. And that process changed my life in so many ways. I knew even before I got the, the formal diagnosis, which took about three months from start to finish, I knew I had it. So within that time, as I was waiting for the formal diagnosis, I signed up for an ADHD coaching program, you know, because I'm impulsive and um, also because it was something that I was excited to do. I, I had been coaching in fitness for many years and I thought about getting into life coaching, but it hadn't really felt right until the moment I found out about ADHD coaching. So I signed up for a program that took a couple of years to complete. And of course I did get my diagnosis. And over that period of learning, it was really transformational for me in the sense that not only was I learning some coaching tools in terms to um, better live with a, a neurodivergent brain, but I was also learning alongside other adults with ADHD, many of them who are also diagnosed late at life. So I suddenly had like this entire community around me of people that thought just the way I did and 
live the way I did and have similar structure, uh, similar struggles. And that made me feel so much less alone. It made me feel incredibly validated. And the training was also really good. So I, I'm so grateful that I had that experience. And I mean, obviously doing a coach certification is not the path for everybody getting uh, late diagnosed, but uh, I would recommend anyone who first gets this diagnosis, whether it's, um, uh, one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching, especially group coaching, you get the the support of the people around you. And that whole feeling of not being alone in your experience is so validating. So I would always recommend just as a sidebar, anybody look into that if they're struggling with this diagnosis, not really knowing you know what to do with it, because that's definitely where I was. So coming on the other side of that, when I finished my coaching certification, Part of my marketing strategy um, was to be in social media sharing my experience. I knew I didn't want to be on TikTok. I felt like I wasn't really relevant from an age perspective. And also, I feel very strongly that short form content is not good for the ADHD brain overall. Mm. Yes, it's great to take in those bite sized pieces of information, but it's like giving candy to a child. What we should be doing is, or what I feel like I should have been doing, was trying to extend the uh, the attention span that I did have, and short form content was not taking me in that direction. So I was very mindful about not being on TikTok. My content does get pushed out there, but I'm not on TikTok. And same thing with Instagram. I predominantly stuck with YouTube and a podcast because. I really enjoyed those platforms. I enjoyed the interaction I was getting with folks on YouTube. Maybe it's a bit of an older um, audience there, and I really connected with them. And that has blossomed into the bigger part of my business. Uh, so I now consider myself a coach that doesn't necessarily do one-on-ones, but I'm a coach for whoever wants to show up and share that experience with me. And it has been an incredibly gratifying experience. And I never would have thought that I would end up here, but I couldn't be happier than I have. I mean, it's been quite a meteoric rise. I'm trying to remember when I first came across you, I'm sure you were around about the 10,000 subscriber mark, which is impressive in itself. Um, I don't know if you can date that for me. I think it was about 10,000. And now you've got nearly 88 and a half thousand you know that oh. you're going to have that silver play button on your shelf before very long. Oh, yeah. And I'm very excited <laughs> about that. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of things there and I can't really remember at what point I was at 10,000, but I was very pumped that I was, I know that I started the channel December of 2021 and my videos were horrible. Um, but I knew that they would get better. Uh, and so I just kept at it. And then every single Friday, I released a new video and there was only one period where I didn't release a video every Friday. And that was one month that I had deliberately taken off of YouTube. I explained to you know my community, I'm going to take a month off to go work on a program. I will be back. And outside of that, I've never missed an upload. So for me, it is the cornerstone of all of my content. My I start with my YouTube channel, which becomes my podcast and the clips become short form content, which I schedule to put on TikTok and um, Instagram, because I want to meet my audience where it's at, but I don't want to be in those places for my own mental health reasons. So, uh, it is, it has not felt meteoric. It has felt, um, like a very slow burn. Cause it's what, like three years ish mm -hmm. now. And I, there's, there, it, there, it, it something to be said about the journey of knowing that something's going to take a long time, accepting that's going to take a long time, but being there because you really, truly enjoy the process. Mm. In the past, we were talking uh, right before we got started recording that uh, I've been you know, putting content on the internet since 2007, and I've never had the success that I've had with this particular channel. And I've always enjoyed um, creating content, but it hasn't been until now that I have brought such a an authentic experience of myself into this content, meaning that I have a whole lifetime of screwing up or things being difficult and not knowing why that I can unpack and share with other people. And 
that human experience is something that, you know, first of all, it's hard to, um, it's hard to connect to that human experience in short form content, which is why I love the podcast and YouTube, but also, um, that human experience is something that, you know, you can't pick up on a 30 second clip. You can't get the same, um, quality of connection through, you know, a chat GBT search or anything like that. I think the secret to the success that I've had is being consistent and enjoying it, but also bringing my whole self to the content that I'm creating and knowing exactly who I'm creating it for. I'm a late di diagnosed ADHD -er and a coach. I am somebody who is naturally very optimistic and hopeful uh, and grateful. Those are my um, character strengths. And I hope that comes across in my content because those are the people that I'm speaking to, those late diagnosed ADHDers. And if anything, I just want to, I want to reinforce the fact that with the right mindset and tools, you know, you can build a life that works for you and live a much more peaceful and happy life and feel that satisfaction that perhaps you have not to date felt. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I, you know, I think you do definitely connect with your audience. I think there's a, a, a realness about you. There's, you, you're not shared, not shared, you're not scared to share some of the challenges that you've had. And, you know, I think for me, as somebody who was late diagnosed as well, the, the, the amount of emotion that came with the diagnosis, uh, regret, shame, validation, anger, all of these sort of myriad different emotions around, well, who could I have been if I'd found out about this when I was 15 instead of finding out when I was 56, I think mm. I was when I found out. Mm -hmm. um, t talk me through the emotions that you went through and, and how, how you kind of channeled them because I, I sometimes get a little bit cross is maybe too strong a word when I see people talking about ADHD being a superpower and you know almost sort of glossing over the fact that yes there are definite strengths and I've, I've learned what my strengths are now but there are challenges that go with it so I do, yeah just share with us the the emotions that you went through and and how you channeled those Mm -hmm. Okay. So the best way for me to describe this being late diagnosed, I will say that in a video that I was sharing on a very similar topic, I remember somebody commented, they were a younger person and they had said, I don't remember the exact words, but they were saying that they loved the fact that they had ADHD and that they had been, it's just, it, they said something to the effect of all you need is the passport or the guidebook on how to operate it. And it's fine. And since she, she had mentioned that she got diagnosed at like 15, so she had that operating manual, like I'm sure she would have preferred it earlier, but she had the operating manual then. So when you're diagnosed as an adult, it's like you're getting your life operating manual 30 years too late. And it's like that in and of itself is like, oh, you know, everybody else had it so much easier. That's when you get into this, you have to have this moment, right? Like you have to have, I'm going to call it a pity party. That's, it, it, it's a very well justified pity party where you have that moment of everything could have been so much different and I could have been so much better. And at this point, both of my parents have passed on, but I know I drove them crazy. And you know, I would have loved nothing more than to tell them this is what it was, but we didn't know. And that would have made some things in my life easier, not all, because growing up in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, I, I don't know that anybody knew enough about ADHD to really support it well, but at least I would have known, right? So that to me is like the, the biggest part that felt overwhelming. So when I first got the diagnosis, I got off the phone, I went to go tell my husband and the tears just started. And those were tears of like, you know, overwhelm and ha like some happiness and just, I, now I know, now I know. And, you know, it, it, it just had to come out that way. But I was very quick to learn uh, to move out of that mode. And I had the benefit of also being in the coaching program that I was in. And one of the things that I learned in that program from a neuroscience perspective 
it behooves somebody with an ADHD brain to be in positive emotion as much as possible. Because when you are in positive emotion, you have the most access to your executive functions, right? When you are not in positive moment emotion, when you're either, you know, freaked out or, or tired or scared or sad, your amygdala takes over uh, the brain function and your executive functions are at their lowest. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that we should pretend to be happy all the time. But what I did learn is if you can be intentional about crafting your life in such a way that it supports you being in positive emotion as much as humanly possible, it's going to support your executive functions and it's going to make things a lot easier. So I had the benefit of learning that like even before I got the formal diagnosis. So I knew I was going to go through this period of sadness, but I was going to come out the other end with um, a conviction to like rearrange my life in such a way that it worked for me. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I find that very often when folks get diagnosed, especially later in life, like you have to go through that mourning period. But if you get stuck in it, then you become a victim of your own circumstance. You were a victim before you were diagnosed because there was struggles that nobody knew, including yourself. So life was just hard. And then now you know, but you decide to, or you don't decide, unless you decide to move past it, you stay in that victim mode. And it's like, woes me, I've got this, this condition and it makes everything harder. And that continues. So you don't have that benefit of positive emotion. You have a mindset of everything's hard for me and nothing's ever going to be easy. And I'm never going to amount to anything because I have the disorder. And that's first of all, not true if, unless you want it to be, or unless you choose that to be the case. And second of all, it's incredibly unhelpful. And Third of all, if, if you're a parent and um, we know that ADHD has a 70% uh, heritability rate, that's not uh, an ideal thought to model to your children either. So having that moment of, of sorrow and expressing it and, and feeling it and uh, really processing it is important, but it's equally important to move past it and say, okay, now what? Yeah. And that's you know, that's really where coaching comes in, isn't it? To help you get through those hurdles. Interestingly, I was coaching somebody who had ADHD uh, before I was aware of my ADHD. And it was her that picked up that she thought I might um, have ADHD. She was a, a neurodivergence specialist. She works with corporate businesses and talks about neurodiversity and, and various sort of factors around um, the workplace. And she picked up in me, I was coaching her around getting stuff done and which is in itself is quite bizarre. It just goes to show that you don't have to be an expert in something to, to coach it. I'm not an expert in getting stuff done. In fact, I'm probably the worst at it, which is probably why I coach well in it, because actually I understand the, the challenges. And it's interesting as well that you um, talked about the familial link. I also lost both my parents so they never were aware of of the ADHD but I look back and I can definitely sort of see traits of it in both my mum and my dad in different ways my daughter's mm -hmm. 34 she was diagnosed just after I was and my granddaughter's nine and we're getting her th sort of through the, the the diagnosis or the assessment process as we you know as we speak really and I think my daughter at 34 still feels, you know, that, that sort of anger, that emotion around why wasn't this picked up sooner? And I really yeah. don't want my granddaughter to experience that anger. I want her to see this. So it's exactly, I love what you just said about having that sort of that playbook early on. I want mm -hmm. her to be aware of the ADHD, recognize that the, the challenges aren't character flaws but actually be able to challenge uh, channel some of her strengths and I can see her, her strengths even you know this young age into something positive so we're we wanting to try and reframe it to something positive from a very early age and I think that's something that because I didn't have that 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 emotion you know it was it was very real and I just wanted to sort of circle back to something that you mentioned earlier around entering perimenopause now I did a, a TEDx talk uh, titled ADHD and menopausal women and for me the the 
you know, the wheels really did start to fall off the strategies and things that I didn't even realize I'd created in my life to manage the challenges kind of went out the window a little bit with the hormonal changes that hit. If you could just um, kind of give us a little bit of your experience of, of how things changed when perimenopause started to kick in, because I do think this is part of the reason why we're seeing so many more late diagnosed women coming coming out. I, I think the awareness has, has been a massive factor. You know, I, mm-hmm. we whatever we say about TikTok, I, I, I'm not a huge TikTok fan, but I learned an awful lot about ADHD from TikTok. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, women are feeling more confident to come out and say that, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this. But I see a lot of people talking about the, the changes when they hit perimenopause. So yeah, if you're happy to just sh- maybe share how the wheels fell off for you. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that I was not aware of either, right? Like I didn't realize, I mean, obviously I knew I would eventually go through menopause, but I had no idea I was in perimenopause and I had no idea that I had ADHD. So it's not like I could look back and say this symptom was directly related to this behavior. But in retrospect, um, some of the ways that it impacted me, I mentioned um, emotional regulation like I just did not have control over my emo- my emotions at certain points. Now, given 2020 was a bit of a you know a hot mess to begin with, but there's a lot of uh, social justice uh, things that were happening here in the U.S. and it was it was really important uh, changes that were happening, but they were also very graphic and terrifying. And I was just constantly. Um, like an emotional mess, like watching the world melt down. Uh, So that was a piece of it. But also I wasn't able to focus as well at work and not to say that my focus has ever been fantastic, but, you know, usually I would work out in the morning and my brain would kind of come online and I could, I could work, but I was missing deadlines and screwing up. And it was just, I, I, I could tell that my, my quality of my work was dropping and I couldn't figure out why. Um, I just chalked it up to anxiety from everything that was going on. Um, and there were other things, but that was the majority of it. Like I was just having a hard time coping and showing up for things and time blindness became more of an issue for me. And it wasn't until I heard uh, that podcast with somebody explaining their experience that made me think, oh my God, this, that's exactly it. So the funny thing is that ADHD symptoms and perimenopause and menopause symptoms can often be very s- similar. So it's hard to pull them apart, right? Mood swings, um, you know, brain fog, forgetting things, like energy fluctuations. These are both and- <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to say that it was one or the other or pinpoint where, you know, one stopped and the other began. I think I relate it in my TEDx talk as being like a, a, a collision, a hormonal mm. car crash when the two sort of collide. And, and it's like you get this double whammy of all of the symptoms of, I don't know, I don't actually like calling ADHD traits symptoms because it it feels like it's some sort of um, disease. (laughs) I don't like to call it that. I prefer to call them traits. I prefer traits, yeah. Um, And and it it, it did feel like those sort of traits that I have to say I didn't even have a name for. And the Mm -hmm. traits or the symptoms with menopause, it was like the they got a like a a rocket boost both of them seemed to just explode and collide and it it was really really challenging Mm -hmm. I'm 58 now and I feel like I'm coming out the other side of menopause which is great so you know some of those brain foggy memory issues are subsiding and it's a real it's a really strange feeling now because I didn't know about ADHD when my perimenopause started and now I do. You're right, it's really hard to kind of go, is this still perimenopause? Is this is this what I had before? Because it feels like it's been years in the kind of the transition. So mm-hmm. I don't know where I'm going with this question. We've just gone, I've gone gone off on a tangent a bit. So talk to me, Karen, about productivity and 
how do you stay productive? Because if you're putting out a YouTube video every week, I'm fully aware of the planning and the the you know the 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 process that goes into being able to do that. That's a lot of work, a lot of planning. How do you manage your time? How do you stay productive? Because I know my, you know, productivity isn't my strongest tool. Planning isn't my strongest um, strength. Strongest strength? It's not my, not my strongest trade. <laughs> right, right. Talk, talk to me about productivity. Well, um, funny that productivity became a big part of my brand because it was probably my biggest weakness. Um, you know, I was never taught to plan my week in advance and, you know, have a, like a, I mean, there's a to-do list that, you know, randomly I'd make for myself and it would just be on a piece of paper that would end up somewhere. But I had never really considered, um, like a process. I would sign up for productivity systems and I would put things in them and then I'd forget to look at them. And then three weeks later, you know, it was, I was off to the races with the next one. I see that in my clients all the time. But it's really not about the tool, which is what I didn't realize before. It's the habitual muscle of creating a rhythm for yourself. And to answer your other question about how do I stay consistent with YouTube and all of that is because I've built this rhythm for myself. So productivity has become a cornerstone of what I talk about and um, what I practice because that and sleep are the two things that without them, I'm, <laughs> I'm a mess. Uh, that's my scaffolding. So it's very important to me, not just because I, you know, have a to-do list, but because it helps me plan my life and create my life with intention, knowing the things that I need in order to set myself up for success. So I'm planning those in to my, my week. And then at the end of the week, and of course, I'm always engaging with my plan throughout the week. And at the end of the week, I have this reflection experience where I go back and ask myself like various different prompts, which are all templated because I would never remember any of them. How did this go? And what felt good? What didn't feel good? What drained my energy? What didn't drain my energy? So I'm not just coming back to my plan, but I'm also learning more about myself with every passing week to really understand you know, where my energy goes and where it's spent efficiently and where it's not spent efficiently. So that's sort of answering the broad interest in productivity and how it helps me. It's all rhythms. And I know a lot of my clients come to me saying, I can't hold a routine down to save my life. And first of all, I don't, I would challenge that because I mean, if you couldn't, if you couldn't hold a routine in your head, you would you're, you would open your eyes every morning and think, what do I do now? You know, do I go eat breakfast or roast a turkey? Like, I mean, we uh, innately have behaviors that we do without thinking. That's part of the human brain. And the reason we fail at a lot of routines is that we're looking at what other people are doing and we think if they're doing it, then it, I, it must be good for me too. And they bring it into their routines without considering whether or not it's good for them, whether or not it's important to them, whether or not it works with their lifestyle and whether or not it's sustainable for them. And, you know, then the routine goes away. So I think that you can layer that on top of productivity as well, like building a rhythm that actually is intentional, works for you and, you know, that you can continue with and it's sustainable. The thing about, um, productivity with ADHD is that we have executive function, um, impairment. So all of the executive functions, we think planning, organizing, um, working memory, all of these time blindness and being able to think about um, activities across time, all of those relate back to productivity. It's not the kit and caboodle because emotional regulation is also something that is impaired for us, which isn't necessarily uh, related specifically to productivity, although I would argue it is. Uh, you know, those are those are the areas where I found I can have the greatest impact both in my own life and in my client's life. So it's where I have leaned into more so, um, you know, coaching around relationships or emotional dysregulation, you know, um, uh, being in fight or flight or uh, in freeze mode. I do talk about those things, um, but I, my focus has always just naturally leaned towards productivity. It's where I like mm -hmm. to focus my energy. And then, you know, uh, in terms of, of maintaining it, I think one of the secrets to my success is that I'm at a place in life where I've chosen 
to do things that I want to do versus things that I have to do. And I worked an entire career that I didn't want to, but had to. So I know how it is to live that way. And slowly but surely, I was gradually able to phase out the career that didn't work for me. Not that it was a bad career. I worked for great organizations, but it didn't fit me. And I always thought it was the problem was me and the problem was the fit. So once I was conscious and aware of that, I was able to plan my way out of those roles and gradually move myself into this coaching creator role that works way better for me. And it has made all of the other struggles that we deal with in terms of productivity and emotional regulation so much easier because of it. So again, that comes back to the importance of building self-awareness around what does and does not work for you and serve you in your current life and how can you plan your way with intention towards something that does support you more. Yeah, I love that. And the, that whole intentionality is so important. There's a couple of things that uh, I'm just that have just come to my mind throughout that. You know, you're absolutely right. We can do routines. I worked for 32 years for the Ministry of Defence in the UK, working for the Royal Air Force. I had a routine. I had to be at work at a certain time. I had to work till a certain time. Otherwise, I got the sack. Um, so we can do it. I would say I'm probably unemployable now. <laughs> I've yeah, had six too. and a half years working for myself. I don't think I could go back to that sort of rigid structure. But what what has come up, become apparent is, and it, I think ADHD is full of paradoxes. And one of the paradoxes is I hate the structure. I hate the routine. I hate the regularity of life as an employed person. But without that structure and that routine and the regularity, I kind of fall apart. And I'd started my um, self-employed journey six and a half years ago. And actually, the, the challenge I've had looking back is because I didn't have those structures in place, I've had to try and create them. And having structure isn't something that I'm naturally good at creating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably exacerbated a lot of the, the challenges. The, the flip side of that, the other paradox is having the freedom to do things my own way has meant I've been able to achieve so many more things than I could ever have achieved as the round peg in a square hole that I felt all of my working life. Mm -hmm. um, I also picked up on, you know, it's not the it's not the tool that's going to make you productive. It's the the routine, the structure around that. Um I'm an ocean fan. I wasn't. I kept looking at it and it terrified me. It looked like this big thing that I had to try and plan and work out. Now I've got my head around it, partly thanks to you and partly thanks to some brilliant notion people on YouTube. And I figured it out. That is my, it is my life brain. It's, you know, it's, I, I, I run my week on it. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I've had to learn to do working for myself I, I have a three-part structure um, every week. I do a reflect, a review, and a reset. So I reflect on what I've achieved the week before. And I don't know if you'll relate to this. I'm hoping you will. But we. I, I don't know if it's true of people with ADHD or of everybody, but I have a very negative bias towards achievement. So I will look back at my week before and feel like I've got nothing done. Nothing, oh, didn't didn't achieve anything I wanted to achieve. So my reflection normally on a Sunday night is, OK, so let's get real about this. What did you achieve? And I'll try and celebrate that, which I would never have done before. The mm. review is kind of, am I still on track to where I want to go? And the reset is, OK, let's get a bit more granular and put stuff in a task list and block time out in my diary. And that has been a massive change for me. And I guess that's exactly what you say. Notion didn't do that for me. Notion just gave me a repository to put all my ideas and all my tasks and all my thoughts. It's the actual process, the structure I've built. And I, I don't think if I'd, if you told me that that's what I needed a few years ago, my first response would have been, I've tried everything and none of it worked. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. that's that's what you're talking about, isn't it? This sort of mindset 100%. shift. That, so, so what what what's the easiest way? I guess if, 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 if this isn't too big a question, to make that shift from it's not the tool, it's the intention. How how do we work that shift? No, it, I, it's not something that happens overnight because it is a mindset shift. Mindset shift. 
mindset shift. Sorry, first day with a new lips. <laughs> uh, I feel like, oh, that's interesting. How would you make that transition? For me, it happened during um, a coaching program that I was in, and I was introduced to this idea of planning. So this wasn't part of my coach training. This was just something I signed up for. And they said, hey, here's how you go through a weekly routine of planning your week and you know going through it. And I, 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 I'm embarrassed to say this, but it was like, whoa, like I never even thought of doing that. So first of all, I guess to break this down, it's the awareness that this routine really helps. That's number one. Number two, to not immediately go to, what is the tool that will help me do this? But what are the habits I need in order to make this stick? Which is, you know, having a certain time for me is Friday and Sunday, Friday for my reflection, Sunday for my planning. And I also make it enjoyable. I put on music. I might have a coffee or a glass of wine. And, you know, it, and my notion is set up so that it's, it feels like a nice little space online for me to work in because it's beautiful and it's set up the way I like it. But it really, I mean, you could do that in a planner on paper. You could do that anywhere. So f the tool is so not Im as important as the, the methodology of when am I going to plan my week? When am I going to review my week? Where am I going to put my plan throughout the week that I'll be able to see it? So if you are somebody who you know, is working at a desk for the majority of the day, then maybe a paper planner will work for you or a digital planner. But if you're somebody who, you know, you're a mom and you're shuffling kids from this place to that place, it might be harder to base your schedule off a planner. You might need something that's on your phone all the time, but regardless of what it is, find something that works for your lifestyle and your circumstance and make a point of building a behavior to come, keep coming back to check it. And that might mean creating uh, alarms and reminders to go back and check your calendar and back and check your schedule, but build that habit. And then, you know, use the tools for however long they're useful. And then you might need to resparkalize them at some point, meaning they might get boring. So you're mm -hmm. less likely to maintain that routine, which means you need to switch it up a little bit. And maybe either, you know, if you have Notion, then you can switch up your templates or you might need to go to entirely a different um, software or paper planner it doesn't matter. Just expect that eventually it's going to get boring and you're going to need to switch out the tool, but it's the behavior and the building that muscle that is so critical. And I think yeah. any one of us can do it. Uh, and once you start getting into it, you'll start to realize the benefits of it. It's not just about planning your week and then reviewing it. It's, as you said, going back through your week and realizing that I feel like I got nothing done, but it actually appears that I got quite a bit done. Because the thing is our brains are wired for a, like a negative bias, right? So we'll always remember whatever is most um, upsetting or emotionally triggering for us. And the thought, I didn't do anything this week is way more triggering emotionally and is going to get embedded in our short and long-term memory than I got a lot done this week. That's like, oh, okay, well, most people do. So you just kind of goes right through your short and long-term memory and you don't maintain it. So looking back at your week as a practice and realizing that you are a person who plans things and executes and gets them done, and you actually are productive, some weeks more so than others, but you have proof that you know you are moving towards your goals and you can be more intentional about it. And very soon you'll start seeing those goals actually come to life because they were planned and they were intentionally thought through. And it also, the other thing with planning is one thing that I do find ADHDers struggle with, um, obviously it's executive function, but it's what I like to call our capacity meter. And we're not very good at understanding where our capacity hits overdrive. So we say yes to all the things and we have very interest driven brains. We want to do all the things. So our capacity meter, if like this is, you know, like this is low and this is high, our capacity meter is like off the charts most of the time. Mm -hmm. That planning process really helps you to gauge where you're getting over, like getting ahead of yourself in terms of your capacity so that you can be more realistic about what you're going to commit to and the expectations you have of yourself and the expectations you can let other people have of you. Yeah. And that, do you know what? I think this is probably where coaching is so valuable because for me, it was about things like recognizing my own boundaries and withholding those boundaries, not just having them, but actually upholding them. Um, mm -hmm. And also not 
not beating myself up too much if I try something and then I get bored with it and have to try something else. I think, I, 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 you know, I've spent many years trying lots of different things. I'm a bit of a tech nerd, so I like all the tech stuff. But I would try it, give it a go and do exactly what you said earlier. You know, I'd do it for a couple of weeks then I'd get out the habit for a couple of days, forget about it. And then really be hard on myself that, you know, the internal chatter around, oh God, why can't you just do this? You, you, you're so stupid. Anybody else would just, you found this, you know, you found this program that works. Why can't you just do it? Uh, so getting rid of that kind of beating yourself up is is huge. One of the things I think works for me as well, I don't know if, um, if this is going to resonate, but I, my mobile phone, this this is an, an ADHD as best friend and worst enemy. It's my best yes. friend because I've got everything that I need. I've actually, you know, on my home screen now, I've created some little widgets um, that go straight to my Notion task list and my calendar. So when I open it up, I don't see any social media um, icons or anything like that. I just see my Notion. And, and that has been really helpful for me because it means that I it's it's helped with distractions. Um, it does have a lot of other distractions that I have to work on. Uh, but yeah, have, having those triggers and, and being willing to acknowledge that, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with using the tools available to actually do the things. Because I think I've always spent my life, and maybe this is because I knew I struggled, maybe this is part of the strategy, has been almost sort of priding myself on the fact that I didn't need to do lists and I you know I didn't need all of these tools almost like having the tools was giving in or failing mm -hmm. in some way and actually I you know I look I laugh at my husband because he would he was in the air force for a long time so they had to have their beret they had to have a hat and you know it was they could be charged if they didn't so to make sure he didn't forget his hat he'd put it on top of his lunch box every day and have his keys to the car in his hat and i used to laugh and think oh goodness me you know what do you really need those sorts of tools but that was his strategy that he didn't so yeah. he didn't forget something for me yeah. that would have felt like if i'd done that it's because I'm not smart enough or clever enough to remember my hat. And yeah. it's taken me a little while, actually, from my diagnosis to go, do you know what? It's all right to use the tools. Use the tools. That's what they're there for. Exactly. <laughs> anything that takes... Again. No, but anything that takes the cognitive load away from you, for your husband to put his keys in his hat and in his hat by his lunch, he doesn't have to think about it. Um, and, and that's a big deal, thinking about cognitive load and the expense of it. Even our, our call today at 2 p.m., I spent the entire morning thinking about, is it 2 p.m. yet? Is it 2 p.m.? And I obsess over it. It's a big cognitive load, which is why I very rarely put appointments on my calendar for that very reason. Uh, the cognitive load is is really great for me. So I, I love that example. And yes, I know we sometimes we're not ready to uh, use those tools, but it, for me, I had to accept them as well, just like I had to accept reading glasses. And you know what? It's just part of the process. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you one thing I have done in my week, which has made a, a huge difference. And I do realize that not everybody's got this privilege, but I now don't book anything on a Thursday. So we are recording this on a Thursday. Um, but I try and keep a Thursday clear in my diary. And it's the redundancy that I have in my week so that if I don't get everything done Monday to Wednesday, I know that I've got that little bit of um, contingency in there. So I've got Thursday if I need it. And if I don't need it, if I've been on the ball and I've got everything, you know, done that I want to get done, I have the reward of a, a nice day to do whatever I want with it. But yeah. I then don't have the stress of worrying that I'm not going to get everything done because I've got that little bit of slack that I can do it on the Thursday if I need to. And that's been a real game changer. And actually, in order to allow myself that Thursday, I've had to be really intentional about what I commit to. So on my phone now as well, I have an icebox, just it's a, a page in Notion. And if I have an idea, whereas I would always kind of dive straight into the idea to the detriment of anything else I was meant to be doing. Now I just Put that idea in the ice box and actually once I've put it in there I feel like I've done something with it and then I'll probably forget about it and it'll never get yeah. done anyway but yeah, I was that's, just that is perfect <laughs> I just would love to know what would your I guess what would your top tip be if you can come up with just one I'm sure you've got 
hundreds. But if you can narrow it down to maybe one, maybe two uh, tips for late diagnosed ADHD women like us who are maybe feeling that kind of overwhelm and not not achieving what they want to achieve, what would be your top tip for them? Well, what I can say is uh, that feeling of overwhelm and not achieving potential, if you will, is the number one complaint of I, not even women, but men and, and women who are late diagnosed. They spent their entire life seeing other people moving ahead and they have not. And it is not for a lack of skill or intelligence or anything like that. I would say one of the biggest reasons that we feel that way is that we start things and instead of putting them in the icebox, which is a brilliant idea, we let that thing take our attention to the point where it's no longer interesting or you know something else, something over here that's more sparkly catches our attention and then we go to that as well, right? So that is not just managing uh, bright, shiny objects but it's this, which is a skill. It's not an impossibility. It's a skill that we need to intentionally build. And then the other piece being the capacity meter, trying to keep all the bright sparklies and do all the bright sparklies. And whether you jump from thing to thing to thing, or you try to do everything at once, you are always going to be behind the person that starts a thing, focuses on a thing and finishes a thing, right? So it's not that person smarter or more talented or anything like that is that that person is doing one thing at a time, whereas you're trying to do everything because you are neurodivergent and divergent is literally this, right? So uh, that skill, building that skill of what you just said, something's interesting, I'll put it in the icebox. If it is interesting and compelling and important enough, you'll eventually find time and space to do it. But what's probably going to happen is you're going to forget about it because everything is new and interesting for a little while until it's no longer, and then off you go. So if that, that would be my number one tip, to build that skill of discernment. Is this important now? Or can I finish doing what I'm doing now? I'll put this aside for the time being and get back to it once I'm done. And you have to know what done looks like. Uh, and then you can go back to it and eh, you may be over it at that point, or it might be the next greatest thing you do. Yeah, I love that. And I guess to own own who we are and not apologize for it, I think has been a big thing for me as well to actually, you know, this is this is who I am and I don't want to spend my life masking who I am or apologizing mm-hmm. for myself anymore. That's be, that's been a massive shift for me as well. Karen, I could probably talk to you for hours about this. I love your take on, well, I love your take on productivity and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. I admire the journey that you're on with your YouTube channel. I'm a tad envious and jealous, <laughs> but do you know, I'm going to take it as a, an opportunity to look and watch and learn and say, Tell us a little bit about how people can find you, because obviously you've got your YouTube channel. Uh, just let us know the name of it and where else the people can find you on social media. Sure. So I definitely invite people to follow me on my YouTube channel, to, channel which is Karen McGill, ADHD and Multipotentialites. I have a link um, my, as well, Karen. Thank you. And then my podcast is It's the ADHD Friendly Show. And uh, I do... Um, I do and I wouldn't say hang out very much on Instagram, but I'm on Instagram enough to, you know, just see what's going on. And that seems to be where I can connect with people more on a one-on-one basis. Like if you send me a DM or you have a question, that's a good place to do it. Ultimately, if you want to ask me questions, I always invite people to get on my Sunday setup email. I send us an email out every single Sunday with whatever I've created throughout the week and, and tools or tips that I'm aware of. Um, and then you can always reply back to that uh, email and I'm always the one who receives it. So um, if you have questions or if you just want to chat with me, that's definitely the best way to do it. Okay. I'll put links to everything in the show notes on the podcast and in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. It's been an absolute pleasure, Karen. Good luck getting to that thousand, uh, thousand, hundred <laughs> thousand subscribers. What's next? What, what's the big goal? Are we, are we looking at sort of Mr. Beast level YouTube or? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I want that, you know, like Ooh. I've had one person n- 
uh, come up to me at, I was in uh, at Ulta, the makeup store in Palm Springs. And somebody came up to me and said, are you Karen McGill? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, oh, I watch you on YouTube. And I was like, oh, this is the first time I've ever been recognized. And I look like hell at the moment, right? Like I was not prepared for that. Uh, and it ended up being a lovely woman who was going through the same coaching program that I was. But it made me think in that moment, like, you just never know when you're going to come across people, which is why I like podcasting. You're, you're not that um, out there. Like I love recording and, and I love meeting people and stuff like that, but they see you before you see them. Right. And it's just, it's a little, like, it takes you back because I'm not a famous person. So <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So could I see myself being Mr. Beast? Absolutely not. Cause he can't even leave his house now. I've never, ever watched a Mr. Beast video. Like I know he's famous, but <laughs> well, I um, we're I not 12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, we're not 12. <laughs> I would not, I would not want that at all, but I would want my, my community to continue to build. I'm thinking about building like an offline, not offline, it would still be online, but like something off of YouTube, um, that continues to be in my mind, but it has to be the right, um, level of connection where, you know, I don't have to show up or feel like I need to show up all the time. So I, I suffice to say there's things down the road, but I'm just going to keep trucking and doing what I'm doing right now. Cause I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, whatever it is you're doing, you're getting it right. So well done. Karen, thanks so much. We'll leave it there for today and do go and follow Karen on YouTube. Her content is top notch. You really do, especially, I mean, watch it anyway, cause it's good. But if you are an ADHD uh, I, I was going to say woman, woman, and I'm I'm sure you don't just appeal to women, but no, forty yeah, percent men, not at all. In my yeah, audience, yeah, yeah, brilliant, Karen. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me. Thank you.